fell down. And when he touched my forehead and realized that I had a high fever, in that moment, his terror mounted because he knew that the polio epidemic that was sweeping New York City had come to Brooklyn, New York. He picked me up and took me around the corner to the office of our family doctor who had a private entrance into our apartment building on the corner. And Dr. Suna said, I fear it's polio, but let's check. And my dad held me across his midsection and Dr. Suna did a spinal and took it right into the laboratory and came back and said, yes. And they took me over to the hospital and when my father looked at the polio ward and realized that children were there for a long time with parents only allowed to see them maybe once a week for an hour, he did not leave me there and took me home again. And Dr. Suna took care of me until the fever subsided and we could see what was left. My father called the March of Dimes and all they said was, we have to wait and see the damage that is left after this initial infection. And so it took a while and they put me in braces. And then at one point my foot started dropping. And so they took the brace off and they put me in a cast. It was at that point that my father felt tremendous frustration because nothing was being done. It was really just holding pattern after holding pattern. He read that Sister Elizabeth Kenny was in New York City. She was an Australian nurse, and because she had been in the Army, she gets the title of sister as a nurse, and had treated outbreaks of polio amongst the Aboriginal people, and had come to the United States to try to show the doctors what her treatment was. Now, she never claimed to have a cure, but she had a better idea for treatment. And her idea was if you take a muscle that's in spasm, which she thought it was, and you immobilize it, if it wants to come out of spasm, there is no place for it to go. So her idea was to try to get the muscle to elongate again. And how did we do that? She did it with hot pack treatments, which I will tell you about. So here I am, my dad calls Sister Kenny it finds, calls every single hotel in New York City to find her and speaks to her assistant and said, my child has polio and can sister come and see her? And the assistant said, absolutely, what hospital is she in? And he said, no, 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 she's at home. I wouldn't leave her in the hospital. And she said, I'm so sorry, Mr. Brody, but sister cannot see anybody in a private home. The doctors and the medical profession here in the States are giving her rather a difficult time and she just can't put herself out to that. And they hung up. And the next day my father woke up and said, no, this is not okay. And he called again and he said, excuse me, I will do anything to get sister to come and see my child. And she finally agreed. My father borrowed a car and drove to Manhattan and picked her up. A large woman wearing a big hat sat in the back and the assistant sat in the front. And when they got to our apartment building at the curb, sister said, the child's doctor is here, yes? And my father said, no. She said, I don't leave the car unless the doctor is here. And once again, he ran around the corner to Dr. Suna's office and Dr. Suna came and escorted Sister Kenny into our little apartment. My mother had laid out blankets on the kitchen table and she had been told to have a pot of water boiling on the stove. Sister walked in and according to my dad, when she saw the cast on my foot, she cut it off and she hurled it across the kitchen and said, we are not treating a broken leg here, we are treating polio. And then she took out strips of wool, all wool, put them in the boiling water three pair of rubber gloves my mom had on and wrung out these hot, wet wool pieces, wrapped them around my leg and then dry wool pieces around that. And then there was no plastic in those days. So oil cloth, tablecloth around my leg so that the wet heat would go in. And once she felt that the muscle had softened, then she would use cocoa butter and massage the leg. And that was gonna be my treatment. 
So naturally, it was hard and it was hot and it was painful, but I was a perfect patient <laughs> even then. Um, my dad would do exercises with me and each day was better. When we realized after several months what the damage was, my leg was two to three inches shorter and two shoe sizes smaller, which is what was for the rest of my life. So I, I wound up with this childhood that wasn't really a childhood. Um, my parents didn't want to make a big deal of it with the people in the building because everybody was afraid. These were times of, um, of great worry in the country with an epidemic. Swimming pools were closed, movie theaters were closed, nobody knew how it was transmitted, and so everybody was frightened. I learned a lot um, in that childhood, mostly because I sat with adults. So when they would bring their chairs out to the sidewalk and sit under the big tree, all of the adults, I learned to be a committed listener, and I learned adult conversation. And so I was prepared that if I wanted to say something and the people turned toward me that I had something cogent and relevant to say. So when I was six, they told me I was going to the hospital. Now, I had heard when you were in, in going to hospital in 1949, you didn't go to get better. You went to die. And so I thought they were taking me to die. But at six, you have no grief for a life not lived. And I thought, whatever this is, this living, I get six, somebody else gets 39, somebody else gets more. I had no idea what it meant. I only knew I wasn't coming back. And so I gave my brother all my toys and I said goodbye to people in the building, neighbors, with a finality they did not hear or understand. And I went to the hospital. The best part, of it was that my doctor was the same doctor for the Brooklyn Dodgers. So I was golden as far as I could tell. Um, they told me I was gonna be going to sleep. And so I started to turn over on the gurney thinking I'm gonna go to sleep. And then of course they said, no, it's gonna be a little different than that. And so they put a strap under my, uh, under my right leg and over my left and strapped my arms down. So she said, so I wouldn't fall off. And I will never forget and nobody who ever had it in those days will ever forget the ether mask. Nobody will ever forget. It's as close to hell as you can come as a child. And when I woke up, I thought they had made a mistake. And I thought, wow, I get another chance at whatever this is. And so everybody in my life has always gotten a second chance. And I came home and I had a cast on my foot and yes, I took all my toys back from my brother. And I went on with my life in a way that didn't make a lot of sense to me. I went to my first day of school with a cast on. My life was very challenging and I could not envision a life like I was looking at with other kids, running and jumping and playing. I, I could not find that in my understanding of the world. And how I wished that I could have given my six-year-old self a letter, a letter saying what life was going to be like for her and how it would have changed her trajectory at that point instead of worrying and instead of fretting and instead of the unknown. So I sat down and I wrote myself a letter to my six-year-old self to tell her what life was going to be like for her. My dear Ina, you're going to begin your life in the hardest way you can imagine. Polio at 18 months, which will lead to a childhood being marginalized, ignored, ostracized, and bullied. You will learn your first lesson when you understand that you are kinder than those around you. Your father will be the one who instills in you that you only have to get up one more time than you fall and he will always be there to part another red sea of impossibility. You will marry Bill Pinckney, who will be famous for sailing around the world solo. And when you understand that his best life will be spent on the sea, 
and yours on land, divorce him 36 years later. You will each leave the marriage better people than when you began it. And neither of you will ever forget why and how you loved each other. Your life experiences will read like a novel and seem a dream to many. You will hang out with Maya Angelou in Greenwich Village, dance with Fred Astaire, go skydiving, go class 10 whitewater rafting and scuba diving. You will ski the Alps and the Rockies on your one good leg. Feed Julia Child and Wolfgang Puck and celebrities and politicians, as well as many Chicago chefs who will grow before your eyes and make Chicago a world-class food destination. You will experience great kindness from Anthony Bourdain, wipe the brow of Mikhail Baryshnikov in the wings of the ballet, appear on a global live stream on World Polio Day to speak about the global polio eradication initiative for Rotary and the Gates Foundation. And Bill Gates will follow you on Twitter. You will try hard to find your place in corporate America, having 21 jobs and getting fired from 19 of them, but learning something from each one that you will need and use later. You will be fearless, Ina, but never reckless. And always see yourself as the causative agent in your story, never the victim. You'll bake your first cake at age 37 and find a strange and exciting joy in that. From that one cake, you will build a baking kitchen, teach yourself how to bake, and create a dessert catering business in 1980 when that does not exist. You will open your restaurant in 1991 at age 48 and realize there is great power in being underestimated. Ina's Kitchen will change the landscape of breakfast forever in Chicago, and it will matter. You will ultimately be known as an entrepreneur way ahead of her time, who created the smoking ban in Chicago, co-founded the Green Restaurant Coalition, and found a recipe for success in compassion, exacting standards, and sheer willpower. Ina's Kitchen will become a theater piece and a stage upon which the Ina will be reborn. Every life-changing experience you will have, every person you will meet, the family of choice you will assemble will enter through that door. You will try with all your might to fit in like most polio survivors and pass for normal for many years until the late effects of polio take their toll, first with a brace, then a cane, then a walker, and now a scooter. After a 33 year career that will bring you much joy and heartache, you will find your exit strategy and pivot to new and exciting ways to use your knowledge and experience. You will write a memoir cookbook called Ina's Kitchen you will be the subject of an award-winning documentary called Breakfast at Ina's. You will write a monthly column in the Chicago Tribune called Breakfast with Ina. Companies will hire you to speak at conferences about breakfast. You will finally get to eat breakfast. What you will love the most are the relationships that will sustain you, especially with the Rotarians you will meet each time you are invited to speak. You will treat each invitation as an honor and you will accept it because you will feel the grace of all you have tried to accomplish and are no longer six years old and afraid that you will never belong. Had I known that my life could be that when I was six, it would have made me a whole lot happier to go through those early years. So I speak to Rotary now because I understand you all have donor fatigue. I understand you've been raising money for Polio Plus and End Polio Now since the late 80s. 
1988, there were 350,000 cases of polio in the world. As of March 3rd, in Afghanistan, we have one. In Pakistan, we have one. Last year at that time, we had 56 in Afghanistan and 84 in Pakistan. So the numbers will certainly go up once we can figure things out with COVID in those endemic countries. But we are on the ground and women are making the difference and they are the polio people in those countries. I posted a video of myself getting a vaccination for COVID and it got about 500 views on my Facebook. And it was me saying, I got polio 11 years before there was a vaccine. And so I'm here today getting my COVID vaccine because I believe in science and I know vaccines work. So thank you for having me come in today. Thank you for listening to my story. And thank you for everything you have done and continue to do so that in my lifetime, maybe there will be no more polio. Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, we here at Pasco County McRotary are delighted to have been a part of a movement to eliminate that disease. Mm -hmm. And we are so delighted to see you today here to talk to us. And there's no doubt that I'm getting ready to cry right now. I, I told you I make grown men cry. <laughs> uh -huh. Thanks so much, Yana. I would, I really appreciate the the uh, courage it takes you and your father and mother in the years you were that you had the polio i i put a plea out to each one of you to to uh give a a memorial gift to polio to the Rotary, rotary international foundation in honor of lina because Thank you. she is a fabulous example of what we should be doing at to get this and it, and COVID has affected a lot of giving, so mm -hmm. just consider mm -hmm. that, please. Yeah, Thanks. That's very nice, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you. And anybody have a question? I'm happy to answer. Yeah, and I encourage you to use the uh, raise your hand. <laughs> uh, I I have one. Uh, uh, Ina, yeah, can you hear me? Um, just uh, your story resonated with me because uh, at the University of Oregon, uh, back before they had uh, really much uh, uh, much curing going on, uh, I had a, a girlfriend who was uh, had polio, and I had a Vespa, and I couldn't figure out how this relationship was going to work. And she says, oh, it's no problem. So we took her canes and we stuck them on the side of the Vespa and we took, uh, went all over campus and uh, picnicked in the Pioneer Cemetery. And uh, I think she, it really uh, was an eye opener for me uh, of mm -hmm. what uh, the bravery of polio people. We really are a type A personality. And it's a very interesting thing that polios married into the general population in the same numbers as able-bodied people. And it's the only disability group that ever, ever, ever did that. I mean, we didn't see anything as, a cha as, as an impossibility. It was just a challenge to try to figure out how to do it. And I think it's because when we had polio, the ones of us who had it in the 40s at least, there was a whole country that was behind us with a very can-do attitude. We beat the Nazis, we can beat polio. And so it was a real feeling of, oh yeah, we're okay here. We're gonna, we have all this support. Um, ultimately the March of Dimes left and went on to um, birth defects, but the polio, the uh, March of Dimes in Canada is still very much involved in polio and post polio, which is a new thing. I started having that in the eighties with a lot of muscle weakness and a lot of changes to my gait and to my strength. Um, and I meet a lot of people along the way who have never told anybody that they had polio as a child. 
And so here they are presenting to doctors without telling them what's going on with them because it was it was a shame in those days. Nobody knew how to get it. And it, it was it was a terrible time, a terrible time. But yeah, we are tough. We are tough, we polios. We are tough. Thank you.